The Queen of Sheba, one of the most fascinating and romantic figures of the Bible. According to the Book of Kings, the Queen of Sheba had heard of the wisdom of Solomon and came to Jerusalem to, quote, try him with hard questions, as the Bible puts it. She even got a mention from Jesus, who called her the Queen of the South, and who told us that she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. These short and enigmatic lines, meagre though they are, have generated a whole literature, and in fact a whole mythology. Medieval legends in many lands were replete with references to the Queen. The people of Abyssinia, modern Ethiopia, have always claimed her as one of their own, arguing that she returned from Jerusalem pregnant with Solomon's child, a child she named Menelik, the progenitor of Abyssinian royalty. The people of southern Arabia also claim her. In their region, there once flourished a kingdom named Saba, and to this day, the ruins of that civilization are claimed as dating from her time. Outside of the Bible, however, the earliest reference to the Queen comes in the Jewish historian Josephus, who gives her a name, Nicole, and who describes her as Queen of Egypt and Ethiopia. Now, in his days, Ethiopia meant not modern Ethiopia, but Nubia, or southern Egypt. In other words, the Queen of Sheba was Queen of Egypt and Egypt's southern province. But could the Queen of Sheba have been an Egyptian? We know that, as a rule, women did not wear the crown in Egypt. The pharaoh, by definition, had to be a man. But just occasionally, at rare moments in history, a woman of royal blood did find herself in power and effectively on the throne. The most famous example of this was Hatshepsut, daughter of Amenhotep I and wife and widow of Tutmos II, who found herself ruling as pharaoh during the 20 years of the minority of her nephew and stepson, Tutmos III. During those 20 years, Egypt's wealth and glory was unsurpassed in the ancient world. Hatshepsut enriched the country with trade and beautified it with temples and palaces, in addition to which she launched a famous and well-remembered expedition to a mysterious and sacred land, land named Punt. Hatshepsut's expedition to Punt, or the Holy or Divine Land as it was also called, has become one of the most talked about journeys of ancient times. That the Queen regarded the expedition as one of the most important events of her life is confirmed by the fact that she commemorated it, and very little else, on her magnificent funerary monument at Deir el Bahri, on the west bank of the Nile at Thebes. Now Punt, or the Divine Land, is located in many Egyptian texts to the east of Egypt, and several of them clearly place Punt in the region of Syria or Palestine. Could Punt have been Israel? And could Hatshepsut's expedition to Punt be the famous journey of the Queen of Sheba to Israel? In 1952, a Russian doctor and polymath named Emanuel Velikovsky published a book named Ages in Chaos, in which he argued that Hatshepsut, who ruled from the city the Greeks called Theba, was indeed the Queen of Sheba of the Bible. In Ages in Chaos, Velikovsky presented detailed and voluminous evidence to show that the chronology of ancient Egypt had been wrongly put together by modern scholars. That Egypt's glorious 18th dynasty, to which Hatshepsut belonged, had been placed 500 years too early. That Hatshepsut rightly belonged not in the 15th century BC, where she is currently located, but in the mid-10th century BC, and that she was a contemporary of Israel's greatest king, Solomon. Before proceeding, it is important at this stage to emphasize that Velikovsky's wish to lower the date of the 18th dynasty came before his identification of Hatshepsut with the Queen of Sheba. The proposed reduction of Egypt's dates came first on, the ground, on other grounds entirely. It was only after he had done this that Velikovsky discovered, to his astonishment, that Hatshepsut 
found her place in history right alongside Solomon. Hatshepsut's description of Punt, a divine land full of frankincense, terraces, borders on the ecstatic. She calls it a glorious region of God's land and a place of delight. Now, until the discovery of Hatshepsut's temple at Deir el Bari, it was assumed that Punt lay somewhere in the region of Syria or Palestine. Numerous Egyptian documents pointed in this direction. However, the bas reliefs in Hatshepsut's temple showed scenes and, and, and animals which seemed to point to Africa rather than Palestine. There were the frankincense trees to begin with. These flourish well only in tropical conditions and are found to this day in Eritrea, Eritrea and Somalia on the Horn of Africa. There were rustic looking thatched houses on stilts which seemed also to point to Africa. There were animals such as leopards and at least one giraffe, which again seemed to point to Africa. There were, in addition, several Negroes shown, though these are clearly differentiated from the Puntites, who look Egyptian and who wear long pointed beards, such as were worn in Egypt only by pharaohs. Taken together, however, the evidence seemed to point to Punt being in Africa. And gradually, all the evidence for locating it in Asia, in Syria or Palestine, was dropped and eventually almost forgotten. And yet, not one of the points mentioned earlier proves an African location. In ancient times, for example, it is a recorded fact that frankincense was cultivated in the tropical Jordan Valley, the lowest point on the Earth's surface, a region with an extremely warm climate. In ancient times too, all of the animals associated nowadays only with Africa wandered freely around Syria and the Arabian desert. Classical Greek, Greek and Roman sources inform us that giraffes were found in Syria on the borders of Arabia in ancient times, whilst ostriches, gazelles and lions were common even into the Middle Ages. Leopards and gazelles still roam the remoter parts of Israel and Jordan to this day. The houses and stilts can be explained by the fact that the region of Eilat, at the head of the Gulf of Aqaba, where the Queen of Sheba's expedition landed, was and is a region notorious for flash flooding. Every winter and spring, heavy showers in the Sinai and Edom mountains turn the wadis of the region into torrents, which converge around Eilat, causing serious flooding. In such circumstances, houses and stilts would have been a very sensible precaution. As regards the Negroes portrayed at Deir el Bari, on Hatshepsut's temple, they were clearly slaves, and this is made evident in the accompanying text, which shows that they were given to the Egyptian expedition as an exotic export of a region called the Southland. There is then no good reason for locating Punt in Africa, and very good reason indeed for locating it in Palestine. In his first year, Tutmos III, who came after Hatshepsut, recorded that he had conquered all the regions of Punt. In his first year, it is well known that Tutmos III did indeed conquer the whole of Palestine and southern Syria. He did not go anywhere near the Horn of Africa, nor did any other pharaoh. How then could he have conquered Punt if it was in Eritrea or Somalia? An ancient tradition from Abyssinia claimed that the Queen of Sheba's name was Makeda. Hatshepsut's throne name was Makera. A single letter is all that differentiates the two names. Were Makeda and Makera the same person? In the ancient Phoenician script, the letters D and R were almost identical and easily confused. Hatshepsut, we noticed, was the queen who ruled from Thebes, Theba, Thebes or Theba. The ancient Egyptian name for Thebes was given as Washe. Should this be read as Shewa or Sheba, a word that the Greeks lisped into Theba? I have researched the question of Hatshepsut and the Queen of Sheba for many years. The more I have looked into the question, the more evidence I have uncovered to support Velikovsky's conclusions. I have presented this evidence to Velikovsky's critics to answer. None have done so. 
If what Velikovsky said about Hatshepsut, the Queen of Sheba, is correct, then by this one discovery alone, he has made the greatest ever contrib contribution to the study of ancient history.